now more than ever, people need to go within and plug into that cellular memory, plug into the divine source, detach as much as possible from the matrix. A lot of these people that have all these abilities, who have celestial star ancestry, they're operating not only throughout this cosmos, but in higher planes, and they're working against the Draco Empire. The photonic energy and the cosmic rays will activate our higher centers. And it's incumbent upon us to ride that frequency wave. Hello again, everybody. This is James Bartley, and you are listening to the Cosmic Switchboard Show. Today, my very special guest is Peter Moon. Peter Moon, born and raised in California, is primarily known for his investigation of space-time projects. These concern projects in the past, present, and future that control both time and perception of time. An avid reader as a young man, he studied creative writing and literature and was particularly interested in both the scientific extrapolations of science fiction, as well as the high adventure that it provided. His interest in Eastern religion and Western occultism culminated in a unique career and association that centered around the private concerns of L. Ron Hubbard, a renowned science fiction writer who was an accomplished occultist but also known as a controversial founder of Dianetics and Scientology. Peter went out on his own in 1983 and moved to Long Island, where his unique background enabled him to forge an association with scientist Preston Nichols, one of the world's foremost experts in the world on electromagnetic phenomena who had been involved in strange experiments at the Montauk Air Force Station on Long Island, which included the manipulation of time. Their collaboration in writing the Montauk Project, Experiments in Time, and its subsequent sequels have now reached legendary proportions. Peter's work caught the attention of time control scientist Dr. David Anderson of the Time Travel Research Center on Long Island, now reincorporated as the Anderson Institute in New Mexico, who invited him to Romania and paved the way for him to investigate other space-time projects as discussed in the Transylvania series, one of which includes what has been called the most amazing archaeological artifact in the history of mankind, a chamber that contains a holographic record of the Earth's history as well as holographic readouts of human DNA and also other species. Peter Moon's websites are digitalmontauk.com, the sister website timetraveleducationcenter.com, and if one wants to peruse Peter Moon's books, and he's written a number of them, and many of them I've, I have read, you can find them on his website, digitalmontauk.com. So without any further ado, Peter Moon, welcome to the Cosmic Switchboard Show. Uh, thank you. It's very nice to be with you tonight. Well, there's so much to get into, Peter, and what I'm sure my listeners want us to delve right into right away is the Transylvanian Sunrise book and your association with Dr. David Anderson, which led up to the findings uh, over at the Basigi Mountains in Romania. For the benefit of our listeners, could you tell us how you became involved in the project, which culminated in your research into the Romanian Sphinx and the Hall of Records. Okay, well, <clears throat> the book, The Montauk Project Experiments in Time, which was the first book that I uh, wrote and published and did it uh, in collaboration with Preston Nichols, I basically ghost descrambled his uh, experiences and put it into a intelligible as intelligible format as possible. And that book <clears throat> created a lot of interest. It, of course, attracted the interest of Dr. David Anderson, who at that time, uh, in 1998, had a time travel research center in an industrial park in Hopog, Long Island, which is, you know, probably an hour and a half away from Montauk. So Dr. David Anderson was interested in that book. Uh, he became a subscriber to our newsletter. He was trying to put together a time travel museum at that time. The day that he actually came to our meeting in uh, August 11, 1999, we used to have monthly meetings on Long Island, 
he actually uh, had just returned from Romania and said he would like to get me there. He introduced himself and, you know, we became friends and he was very interested in the spiritual angles of uh, time travel because he said physicists at that time were now starting to, you know, make a pivot and start to look at the spiritual aspects of consciousness, uh, keeping in mind that the observer, the physicists have always recognized the observer, but they never called it the spirit. Same things. So anyway, uh, David was very interested in my experiences in Scientology and whatnot. But David always was a mysterious character, and he wanted to get to me to Romania, but he eventually kind of disappeared in 2003. Uh, or was it 2000? Yeah, it was 2003 that he gave me what he had left of his time travel research center archives and departed into, I guess, well, you'd say he went dark. He, he, uh, closed down the time travel research center in Long Island. He had one in New Mexico that he divested any proprietary interest in, or at least claimed to have divested any proprietary interest in. Because at that time, the government was coming down on him hard. They were causing uh, break-ins. I believe it was the government. They didn't say. But there were break-ins at his time travel research center on Long Island. And the the government said, hey, we can help you with your security problems. Which only led me to to conclude that they were causing the problems in the first place. So anyway, he sort of became more partnered with them than he already was. He was relatively independent. Relatively. Relatively. Uh, there's always going to be a connection with him and the government on some level. But uh, so anyway, in the meantime, in 2003, about the time he was actually right after he said goodbye to me, the night before Easter on uh, 19 in 2003, he, I said goodbye to him in Rochester, New York. I would not see him again for five years. He said it would be five years before he could work with me again. And then... That following August, we had a major blackout in New York, uh, and not centered around New York, but it extended out into Ohio. I think it made its way up into Canada as well. But this uh, electric blackout, <clears throat> well, that was going on in the New York area, which we were all anticipating this great blackout of, or this great happening of what would occur in August 2003 because of the biorhythm that would, you know, peak every 20 years in August. 43 was the Philadelphia experiment. In 1963, there was a project in Brentwood, Long Island, and, and this was the forerunner of the HARP project, which we now know about in Alaska. And then there was the uh, 1983 Montauk project. And so 2003, we were anticipating something. Well, we had the blackout, but there was also in Romania at that time uh, an excavation taking place that was centered around the discovery of a chamber that was noticed by satellites owned by the Pentagon were noticing that there was a chamber uh, of note underneath this structure in Romania, which is known as the Romanian Sphinx. It's the most popular tourist attraction uh, in Romania. And it's... Uh, relatively unknown by the outside world. It is not unknown in Romania, but it's unknown by the outside world, and it's only become known through the uh, the story. Now, I did not initially instigate or write about the Romanian Sphinx. This was the work of a Romanian author who worked in the intelligence department of Romania's government, the most secretive department known as Department Zero. He was a writer. He was brought in to write the story and to observe certain... Uh, he was allowed into this mysterious chamber inside the uh, beneath the Romanian Sphinx. And this chamber contains, uh, per the book, very modern, what we would call modern technology, but it's ancient technology believed to be some 50,000 years old with uh, six feet high tables. In other words, you'd uh, have to be very tall to be able to sit at them. And 
they could get up on these tables and put their hands over the sections of the table and then they put their hands over a certain section it would read out their DNA and then it would read it out more microscopically if they put their hand closer to the the square on the table and going down to the atomic structure of the hand. Now if they went to other squares or other tables because there was more than one table they would see a readout uh, depending on what square they went over of a specific type of animal that might be from Earth or might not be from Earth. It might be from a different planet. And it would be shown holographically, this readout of the animal, its DNA, and also the star system at which it came from in the planet. That's how they could recognize the star, because the, the words were not in English. So this was a find. And, and then if they put their hand over one square and then put their hand over another square at the same time, they would see a holographic combination, a hybridization of the two different types of animals or life forms. So this was like a virtual Noah's Ark plus because it not only had recorded DNA in a computerized format, it told you the possible permutations of DNA and how these things could fit together and what they would form, what it would look like. Now, at the time this book was written, that particular chamber had only been investigated for a maximum of six weeks at the most. And so they were just discovering things about it. There was also an area of the chamber called the projection hall where you could see on a screen or it was not a screen, it was a holographic projection of the history of the world. And you would view, I think he viewed something that was something on the order of a, you know, 45 minutes to an hour and a half summarized version of the, of the history of the world. And it was tailored to him. In other words, it was bioresonant. So what you would see in this projection hall would be different than what I would see or that would be different than somebody else would see. Now, in addition to this in the chamber, there were three tunnels. And they knew that one tunnel went to Tibet, where there was a similar installation, although the installation in Romania was the flagship or main installation. There was a similar installation in Tibet, accessed through a very long earth tunnel that had offshoots or branches, one to Mongolia and one to Iraq. And there was another tunnel that had, and this tunnel was not really an earth tunnel. It mimicked an earth tunnel, but it was sort of a parallel universe tunnel that went to an actual earth tunnel beneath the Giza Plateau in Egypt. So that was a bit more of a far out story. The third tunnel was said to go to the inner earth. And th he doesn't really offer any information on that tunnel. I figured out a lot about that tunnel just from my osmosis in the country of Romania and interfacing with certain factors in the country of Romania. I've been there, you know, I've been going there every year since 2008. And uh, I I've had some wonderful and intriguing adventures there. So uh, that is the chamber. Uh, that is the, the book Transylvania Sunrise, which is available at skybooksusa.com. Basically, all leads up to that discovery. The entire book is sort of a political chess match preceded by the description of the man who actually is responsible for accessing this. He is a a Romanian citizen who grew up with a huge umbilical cord. He was monitored because of this umbilical cord that was anomalous because uh, the doctors reported to uh, the securitate or the security any strange births. And the security of uh, Romanian intelligence came and they arranged for him to work with a, uh, a doctor of... Parapsychology. It's parapsychology. And this doctor was uh, 
uh, from China, known as Red China at that time in America, because there was a huge uh, alliance between the Romanians and the Chinese, both being communist countries at the time. And they brought this man, Dr. Zen, Zen, X-I-E-N, over to set up their paranormal department for Romanian intelligence. And in return, the Romanians would educate Chinese. And they brought Chinese over to be educated in Romania. Uh, Romania had very, had and has very good schools. The people in Romania, by and large, are far more intelligent than what you'll find in America. Uh, a lot smarter. They're not always as uh, sophisticated when it comes to uh, certain cultural and certain business situations, but they're by and large smarter. And in, in a lot of it is because their culture, although it suffered a lot with communism, there was a lot of suffering during that period, they were not uh, polluted with some of the more negative aspects of capitalism, uh, such as improper food and, and that sort of thing. So anyway... The book Transylvania Sunrise goes into a lot of the political intrigue. It starts off uh, with my adventure, first adventure in Romania, being sponsored uh, by the World Genesis Foundation, which uh, David Anderson founded, administers a camp in Romania once every summer, which I go to every summer, called Atlanticron. So it... it, it that's how the book begins with my adventures with this time travel scientist who actually arranges for me to go to Romania and I learn a lot on that first trip. I learn about sacred Romania. I've learned things that are not in uh, the four books by Radu Sinemar and I wrote a fifth book, The White Bat, to cover some of those. But anyway, the, some of the more important, the most important aspects actually are in that book, uh, The White Bat. But uh, in any case, that's a, I've spoken for quite a while here. That's a summary of Transylvania Sunrise and how I got involved. There are some key players in the story. You mentioned Radu Sinemar. And if memory serves, Radu Sinemar was approached by a shadowy figure uh, by the name of Mazzini, who... Uh, presented himself as being a high-level Italian Freemason with connections to the Pentagon. Apparently, like you alluded to earlier, the, the ground-penetrating radar of the uh, Americans had noticed this excavation going on and also noticed these underground cavern systems. What is the role that Mazzini played, and was it through him that the Americans became involved? Well, reportedly so, and from everything I've been able to uh, ascertain, Signor Mazzini is is a uh, spelled M A S S I N I. It's not uh, spelled the same way as Giuseppe Mazzini, who uh, inherited the Illuminati from Adam Weishaupt. Giuseppe Mazzini is a very important man in history because he was a Jesuit who succeeded uh, Adam Weishaupt as the head of the Illuminati, and basically. Italian Revolution, which uh, overthrew the Papal States and set up the current Italian nation that we know as Italy. There was no Italy before Giuseppe Mazzini. <laughs> there were the Papal States. They were known as the yeah. Papal States. And he neutered the, the papacy, and it was only resurrected by Benito Mussolini, who used it as a financial clearinghouse. And that, that's an important piece of history that people aren't necessarily apprised of, uh, Mussolini's role in resurrecting the Vatican. Uh, along with the help of uh, Marconi. So anyway, I mean, that's sort of a side story, but Italians are very important people in world politics, dating at least back to the time of Julius Caesar. Uh, very dominant culture. All roads lead to Rome. And Giuseppe Mazzini uh, claimed to be very high up in the, the Bilderberger group, and he was uh, from a, an, an important Freemason lodge in Italy. And he said that uh, his connections in the Pentagon had discovered this chamber in Romania. Now, he quite uniquely, perhaps, spoke Romanian fluently, according to the book. And when he first spoke to uh, 
who's really the, the main character in the book, uh, Cesar Brad or Cesar Brad, as they would say in Romanian, he basically took him out into a field. They spoke on a table. This is, you know, he visited him so that they wouldn't have any eavesdroppers. But he spoke Romanian. And it is not typical for Italians to understand Romanian, especially to the point where they could have a conversation that's uh, on this level. Romanians can understand Italians much more easily. It's the root language, Romanian is. So, so anyway, he was, he, he had some sort of grasp of the Romanian language for whatever reason. But he, uh, told this Cesar or Cesar Brad that, you know, we, we, he approached him because he knew that Cesar Brad had a, an important, had been groomed to have this important role in, uh, in Romanian intelligence. And Brad was, was very, uh, puzzled by the fact that this man even knew his job because there were only, a couple people in Romania who even knew about his job. It was so highly classified. So he basically, this Italian, Mazzini, said, we know there's this chamber underneath the Sphinx. We don't know what it's in. We know this through our contacts in the Pentagon, in which he's basically saying that there are Masonic representatives working in the Pentagon for the Pentagon, which shouldn't surprise anybody. But in any case, that... They were the ones feeding him. So he, through his connections, he arranged for the Americans, the American military or a certain aspect of it to open up this chamber. There's a lot of political intrigue around this because the, neither the president of the United States, who was George W. Bush at that time, nor the president of Romania at that time knew what was going on. They only found out by happenstance when the troops that had invaded Iraq, the American troops had found uh, the similar underground chamber, uh, a similar one, and they were guarding it. And while they were guarding it, they saw a holographic projection bust come out at the same time that the Americans were uncovering the chamber in Romania. And the reason the Americans were uncovered it, because they had the technology, it required high-powered atomic lasers to bust open this chamber. And it, it, even that didn't do everything, but it, it certainly, the Romanians were not capable of opening it themselves with their existing technology. So when they opened it up in Romania, it set off a, a signal in the station in Iraq that basically gave a holographic projection demonstrating that there was a similar installation in Romania and that it was being opened up. So this was reported up command channels from the American soldiers in Iraq uh, to eventually getting to the White House, uh, which resulted in, uh, by the report, the president either calling directly or having his people call the Romanian president and saying, you know, what's going on? And uh, the Romanian president says, I don't know <laughs> what's going on. So he asked down his, his uh, head of Department Zero, uh, General over Department Zero, Obadia, General Obadia. And General Obadia was a very diplomatic character. He does no longer alive. But uh, he went and convinced the president that what they were doing, they had to do. And uh, there was a lot of tension initially between the Americans and the Romanians because this was a very uh, hot issue. But the long and short of it is that America and Romania formed an alliance uh, in 2003, where Romania became a part of NATO, Romania is now the United States' strongest ally in NATO, at least in that part of the world. And Romania is now surrounded by countries that are either non-NATO or are thinking of departing, neutral, like uh, Turkey. Turkey's become a neutral country with all of the stuff that's happened over there. So Romania is now being surrounded, and it's very easy to... Uh, speculate that the whole concern is this uh, esoteric aspect to Romania. So the Russians uh, know about it, and sometimes they find about it through the books that I write. Uh, this happened in Egypt when there was the riot in Egypt. The Egyptians were reading or getting wind of what was in these books. Because when they, when they were published in Romanian, they were published in Romanian years before I published them in English. Egyptians don't read Romanian. It doesn't get through the grapevine. 
the only ones who understand Romanian are Romanian. You know, it's a Romance language, but it's it's they understand the other Romance languages, but the other Romance languages do not understand them. Because as they say, it is a root language. So, uh, the Egyptians, yes, they read English. This book comes out in English. All of a sudden, boom, 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 boom. What's going on here? And then there's this whole scandal in Egypt, the Egypt uprising. And, uh, you know, I, I don't keep up to date on Egypt. I have friends that have done tours there and have accompanied me on my tours to Romania. But, um, yeah, so there's, there's a lot of, uh, I guess what you call undercurrent of American politics that certainly you're not going to see debated in, uh, like the recent debates we had here in America. Uh, they're not talking about esoteric issues. They're talking about uh, other issues. So anyway, this is some of the background, if I answered your question about Mazzini, the, the uh, Italian. Absolutely, yeah. And you mentioned earlier that when uh, Radu Sinomar was young, he was essentially mentored by this uh, Dr. Zien from no, China. No, that was Cesar Brad. It read, oh, I'm this sorry, part Cesar is, Brad. Is comes on the scene late. He's selected by Cesar Brad to write the story. And as part of oh, okay. the story, he's allowed to be in the chamber for uh, a short amount of time. You know, uh, a short amount of time to view and inspect it. And interestingly enough, in his last letter to me, which is some five years ago, almost six years ago, I think, uh, Radu said to me, he says, I promise to do everything I can so that you can someday see this. Uh, I, I hope I hope you do. That would be fantastic. Uh, you'd be the right person to, to go there. Uh, what I was leading up to was it seemed that the, the Chinese communists had an an in an inroad into the whole project. Now, after the Americans came in, did they elbow the Chinese out completely? Well, the Chinese did not really have an end to this, and I, I don't, that could be misconstrued. Uh, it was an individual Chinese doctor, but he really okay. wasn't Chinese. You see, this he really wasn't Chinese. Uh, you find out in the second book, he arranges a meeting with Radu Sinemar, because he's never met Radu, but he arranges a meeting with Radu Sinemar, and this is done via a friend of his, who uh, is a man who is named Eleanor, Eleanor being a male name in Romania. And Eleanor is the go-between, and he contacts the publisher, who is uh, uh, my publisher, in, in Romanian publisher, Sarin Hormuz, and he contacts him and basically asks to speak to Radu, and, and uh, no calls are forwarded, uh, and, and he persists, and... He finally says, what does he want? And he says, well, I want to introduce you to a Tibetan Lama. And Radu hears this and takes an interest. So a meeting is set up in an exclusive neighborhood of Bucharest, which I have visited. I was able to figure out very, very, I don't know if the word's adroitly or cleverly, but I figured out that this was indeed the neighborhood because it was just as described in the book. And beautiful neighborhood, but basically very modern. And Radu shows up there and uh, has this long talk with this alchemist uh, about living forever. Uh, living forever uh, because the alchemist has been initiated into a tradition um, from one of his ancestors who lived hundreds of years by pursuing the ancient art of alchemy. That's a whole other story. When you read the chapter one, it's chapter one of the second book, Transylvania Moonrise, which is preceded by an introduction of Romanian press articles verifying that this stuff originally took place because there was a lot of uh, corroboration when the first book was published uh, that this stuff did indeed take place. Although there's uh, a great number of Romanians who just accept all this as science fiction. They say Radu is, uh, is a science fiction writer. So, but no, that's not actually the case. So it wasn't... Uh, and then you find out that this this Chinese doctor is really a Tibetan Lama. And this is being orchestrated uh, from a Tibetan perspective. And he's an incognito Tibetan Lama who, you know, occupies the role of a doctor of the paranormal in China. There is also a connection historically between China and Tibet that is generally not known. 
there's a recent book on it, which I have not read, that goes into the whole relationship between the Chinese emperor and the, and the lamas of Tibet and how the Dalai Lama was set up by the Chinese government. Because the Dalai Lama is really uh, a come-lately in- institution to Tibet. Uh, it's the, uh, the indigenous religion of Tibet is the Bon religion or Bon Po which was originally called the Mon religion, M-O-N, uh, and this is where we get words like Mongol and Mongeria. So in any case, Red China or China never had an in in this. Okay. They had a cultural relationship with Romania, and uh, they got angry when Dr. Zen disappeared, because he, he just disappeared uh, after uh, the chamber was... Uh, was breached and the, the Chinese accused the Romanians of hiding him or killing him. And it took a lot of, uh, took some diplomacy to convince the Chinese that that was not the case. And he eventually, I think, might have made his way back. But he has, he, I have learned, and, and nobody really told me this, but there's a lot of strings that are pulled from Tibet into the governments of the world and they're their hidden strings, and that there's a lot more control that goes through the esoteric into the governments than you would naturally think about or see. And these are very old, just like all leads Rome, lead to Rome, you could make a case that all roads lead to Tibet and by way of Romania, or sometimes vice versa. So uh, Romania being the older country than certainly Italy. Not necessarily Tibet, but they both have similar traditions. And when you get into the deep esoteric aspects of the two cultures. Now, you mentioned that there were tunnels that led from the Romanian site to Tibet, Mongolia, and Iraq. Was there any suggestion that there were like teleportation portals that led from one place to another? No. The only suggestion of something similar to that in, in, with regard to the tunnels is, is the Egyptian tunnel, which is, uh, is one of the tunnels you sort of go through a, I, I don't know how to describe it, you know, it, it looks like a parabolic mirror or whatever or some sort of contraption, but you, you go through it and all of a sudden you're buzzing into another, it's like another reality. And you, you, and you see what appears to be tunnels. It, they look, you know, like tunnels from the Flintstones or something. I, they didn't describe it like that, but, you're seeing tunnels that look like tunnels, but they're reported that they're not necessarily tunnels in this earth plane, but they run along with it. So it's a, they're virtual tunnels, but they look just like tunnels and they behave just like tunnels. And they're, they're using a high speed car that's something like out of the Jetsons. And it's the best of American secret technology. It's, it's got a lot of biosensors in the technology and, uh, it's a real state of the art. I mean, they're going at high speeds, and it's also able to project ahead of itself, so it's not going to bump into things or hit things. And it can go at high speeds and it's sending out projecting sensors, so it's not going to hit anything. Another aspect that I've always found interesting is the Edgar Casey connection. Now, is it possible that when Edgar Casey made his prediction about the uh, a hall of records, rather, being found beneath the Sphinx, that he may have been referring to the Romanian Sphinx, vice the Egyptian Sphinx? Well, you know, that's an excellent question. And Edgar Casey, I had uh, friends who were very deeply involved with the ARE, the Association for Research and Enlightenment, uh, although it was never an organization I, you know, participated in. But I, I got some of the cream of uh, information and whatnot. In fact, it was, it was pretty funny. Um, I had this dream once. I was on vacation, actually doing my marketing plan for the Montauk Project up in Lake Placid. And I had this dream that Edgar Casey and his son were to be eliminated in Europe. There was a plan to eliminate them that was centered around the patent assassination. And I remember calling my friend who had been at the ARE 
and telling him this, and he says, write this down, write this dream down, and send it to me. So I wrote it, and I sent it to him. It was a couple of pages long, single-spaced, and he sent it in to the ARE, a dream interpreter, and of course, he contacted me, not the dream interpreter, but my friend, and he says, you know, I, I sent it in, and he says, they, they file these things. All they do with these dreams is they just file them. They have too much mail. He says, but yours caught on the letter opener. Yours caught, and, and it, it stopped the process. So because it stopped, the, you know, the guy, whatever he was, the file clerk, the dream interpreter, whatever he was, he picked it up, and he read my dream. In other words, all these dreams don't get, get read. And um, he read it, and he says, uh, this has to do with the uh, dreamer's own uh, personal issues. And, and and this was the most nonsensical dream interpretation I've ever had in my life, you know. he This guy had no idea who I was, what I was investigating. And, you know, I could, you know, flush the whole ARE down the toilet with that sort of a comment. Although I don't really think the ARE should be flushed down the toilet. But because uh, there was a lot of, you know, valuable research and information that was done there. It's just that attitude of, uh, but anyway, a what I had learned is that, and this is not necessarily in publications, is that Edgar Casey had said that the, there were four sphinxes on the planet and that the they were built in, by people that resembled cats. They were cat people. And the Egyptian one was the only one that was left. Well, you know, Edgar Casey's readings were, you know, something in the high 90% accurate. They were not 100% accurate. And he's just reading uh, off the Akashic Records, whatever you want to call it. He's reading. He's not, you know, giving precise renditions. But he's, he's generally pretty close. So I would say that he was uh, wrong. There was uh, still a Romanian Sphinx. And there was still, well, I obviously said there was an Egyptian Sphinx. And the Hall of Records, and this, what I've learned is, uh, about this is there, there was supposedly a Hall of Records beneath the Sphinx that was cleaned out by the American intelligence services after World War II. All right? Um, there were chambers beneath there, mentioned in a book by David Lewis. I had a personal friend uh, who was called Madam X in my books. Her real name is Chelsea Flores. She's now deceased. She's a very wonderful woman. And she figured out where these were. These chambers were from the David Lewis books, and she actually went there and, and went down into these chambers. Of course, there were no Hall of Records. These were put out on a video with a cinematographer named Boris Sahid. Boris Saeed was selling these things for about $20 at one point. They were, I think he was trying to raise money to do a, a full-fledged documentary on them. But this was all done incognito. A lot of people were pissed off that they got underground because she was literally showing up all the naysayers. And what the, the uh, I guess what you'd say, the response was this award-winning, Emmy award-winning video uh, I think it was called The Mystery of the Sphinx, starring John Anthony West with Charlton Heston narrating. And it was, it was a bunch of crap as far as ignoring what was really being discovered. You know, uh, John Anthony West had spent a lot of time fighting, I think, with Zahia Loss. But John Anthony West was not privy to any of this. You know, he was just doing his own thing, whatever that was. And I'm not discrediting anything. The only thing that was really funky about, they made it, you know, like this big scientific discovery of the erosion of the Sphinx had taken place. This was all via, I mean, it, it had happened, but this was discovered, you know, back in the 70s by a friend of mine named Howard Metz. He had all the papers on it. And I don't know that he discovered it, but it was all known about. He gave the papers to the Getty Foundation who were active in preserving it. So this is, I mean, the media is really kind of like, eh, on these subjects. But whatever, the Hall of Records, so there might have been some records that were taken from that chamber after the war by American intelligence. Now, there is 
and, and to answer your question in the positive, yes, it, it is the, these hall of records that are described in Romania and also in the third book in the series, Mystery of Egypt, where they go down that tunnel to Egypt, there are also archives underneath the Giza Plateau. And these archives can only be compared to slate disks, which are sort of something like a computer disk. Um, they're not round, but they're slabs. And if you hold them in a certain way, they will give a holographic readout. So they're like, they're tablets that contain like holographic data, which will project outward. So you're watching holographs uh, of the history of the world. And part of the mission to Egypt in the book Mystery of Egypt, they're going to retrieve as many of these disks as they can take. And they're to go back to the Pentagon where they will be studied. There is also in Beneath the Giza Plateau, according to this book, The Mystery of Egypt, a similar device which is actually enables you to time travel consciously. You do not travel with your body. You time travel mentally. Again, this device is bioresonant. So if you set on it, you might go into a different part of history uh, or time and adventure than I would based upon your interests. And uh, descriptions of Caesar Brad, who does go back into these, into this, uh, tries to find out who built it. And there he's blocked. There's like censorship uh, when he tries to find out who built these, uh, these tunnels and devices and whatnot. So that is uh, a little bit about, uh, you know, answer your question. Yes, the Edgar Casey was right, just not 100% right, uh, if this story is to be in any degree accurate. Key part of your work is that you pointed out the significance of synchronicity in all this. In fact, if memory serves, the subtitle of one of your earlier books was Adventures in Synchronicity, and so much of what you've said today resonates with me. Tibet, even you mentioned General Patton earlier, and yes. and all the stuff that's going on. It, it's, it reminds me of a lot of dreams and mystical experiences I've had that are directly connected to all this. Now, as far as the uh, location of the site, it seems to me that there must be a power source there that still is uh, active because when they went in there, it sounds like things powered up. Is that the case or do they have to find a way to turn uh, the, the power source and turn the machinery on? Well, according to the book, uh, in, in, say in Romania, there are power cords and cables, but they are very, you know, there, there might might be more like something you might see in Close Encounters of the Third Kind. If the, I don't know if they show power cables on that, but it, it would be, you know, very... There were power cables, but they were very uh, advanced. So, as far as it powering up, yes, uh, these things have the potential to power up, and energy is not an issue with highly advanced civilizations at all. The, this stuff we're going through is really in the retard stage. And it still is in the retard stage as far as the way this a civilization has dealt with energy. Yes, it's been completely bass backwards. It's They're burning everything up in order to create energy instead of just plugging into the ether, which is all around us. Exactly. It's like uh, people do things wrong. And the more it's beginning to change to somewhat, but instead of, you know, when somebody comes and tries to do things right, they want to do them more wrong, and they want to eliminate the right. Right. So it's it's like a, as they say, there's no other word to describe it other than retardation and a disease of the human mind or the human body, which is demonstrated in the human mind. So we're really dealing with a very sick, sick civilization. And to answer, yes, I wrote the second book, Montauk Project. The second book was Montauk Revisited, Adventures in Synchronicity. And then some 10 years after that or so, I wrote another book called Synchronicity and the Seventh Seal. And synchronicity is a word that was coined by Carl Jung, the famous psychiatrist, a psychologist, psychiatrist, who basically said that synchronicity was a word 
a poor excuse for describing the Tao, meaning the Chinese word T-A-O, which uh, can be loosely translated as the way, or the fundamental principle behind all principles. And he said that synchronicity is the precursor to the Tao. When you're getting to the core of the core of what's behind life, you will encounter synchronicity. Yes, indeed, because that's what I've been experiencing during this conversation. Uh, another thing you mentioned earlier was the projection hall and the fact that when an individual steps into the projection hall and is read by the or scanned by the technology, it seems to know everything about them. Was it reported that there was perhaps an aspect of reincarnation related to the projection hall? In, in other words, was the system able to determine what the past incarnations of a given individual were? I don't recall anything of in- reincarnation being brought up there uh, because it really wasn't about who you were in, in a past life, so to speak, or any of the characters. I do not recall them uh, speaking of who they were. Um, but certainly the most obvious readout would be of your DNA. Your DNA is resonant with life and it's going to read off your DNA and your mind is your DNA and all of this sort of thing. But to put this in perspective, these installations are very, very old. And because they're very, very old, they existed before, way before human civilization, uh, 50,000 years or so before human civilization as we know it rose out of the, what they like to say, it came from Mesopotamia or whatever. But before that civilization arose, or or the Indus Valley, or in Romania, wherever it arose. But these very ancient civilizations, which do tie to Tibetan elders or Tibetan elder philosophy or, you know, legends, are sort of like, could be considered to be like an eye of God in, in the most broad terms of using that term, broad way of using that term. In other words, if you were to, uh, well, just as we have outposts on Mars that, you know, have cameras and take pictures of what's going on Mars, so would a bigger intelligence uh, that represents the entire universe, the God mind of the universe, where we are fractured splinters of a bigger consciousness, yes. It's like going back to daddy, going back to mommy. That's really what's involved here. So, yes, it sees you because you are an image of the creator. We're all a part of the creator. So that's the imagery. It's like you're, it's, we're not as foreign. It's not as alien to us as we think it is. And it's, we're not as alien to, to this force as we think it is. It's kind of like coming to, you know, the control room in an abandoned uh, facility. Except it's not an abandoned facility. It just appears to be that way. And uh, it is part of an orchestration for the recovery of consciousness. And this gets into more of the fourth book, The Secret Parchment. Five Tibetan initiation techniques. So that it's, you see that there's a whole drama that these books serve on a bigger, bigger scale. You've went back to Romania several times over the years. Have you noticed outwardly at least a visible military security presence uh, in and around the site on the surface? Well, my personal views of military are rather limited. There were troops, I've seen pictures of troops in the area, stories of troops in the area, people have told me that when the Americans were uh, there, that everybody in the entire town of Bushtemi, uh, which is, you take a cable car to get up to the sinks from that town, uh, they were all, the, the hotels were filled with Americans, and they were all told to not talk about the Americans. Now why in the hell would, would all these Americans be going to a hotel uh, up in the, uh, you know, Carpathian Mountains. You know, what? why? It, it just makes no sense. 
you go in certain directions, you can find military presence. The current place access point to the Sphinx is probably southeast, well, southwest of Pusteni, but southeast of the Sphinx itself in the mountains. But it's very well hidden and very well camouflaged because since that time they've had time to camouflage it very well. And so you, you might not stumble upon it too easily. There were reports of troops in Transylvania when I was there. Sarmasejatuza, which is the sacred area that has been very special to me. I was, uh, it was like a week before I got there, there were troops walking around that. There's a lot of archaeological excavations and secret stuff going on there. You know, some of my friends there are in the military or have been in the military and, and they acknowledge stuff. It's just a different culture. In the time we got left in the first hour, one question that has come to mind is, has there been any efforts to remotely view this site? Uh, if one cannot gain a- physical access to it, have uh, mystics and seers made efforts to remotely view it or astrally break into it? Well, of course. Um, the people controlling <laughs> the uh, project, such as Radu, Radu is very schooled in remote viewing himself. Uh, he even did a program in America on it, but it's not necessary for the people who are involved. If you're asking outside, people outside... Yes, absolutely. Well, I, I don't uh, deal with remote viewers for the most part because they are, most of them are very afflicted. Most of them have been part of projects that have been run by Satanists. There's a lot of negative... Uh, underbelly with the remote viewing community and uh, of course when you get into the subject of remote viewing and this is without casting any aspersions on any of them there's blockages it's like playing psychic chess okay I block you here you block me there who's got the most block who's got the biggest amplifiers and it's been described to me that many of the world leaders are surrounded by psychics and whatnot. And certainly I've met some of them that have, you know, done channeling for corporate executives and this sort of thing that you wouldn't necessarily think. But uh, this stuff, what I would say is it's really meant for those who are meant to learn about it and experience it. And accessing it, I have seen Romanians hotly debate whether this chamber is real and corporeal reality as we would know it. Like, you know, walking into the White House, you'll see the Oval Office. You'll really see a real Oval Office. Some people will say that when you walk into this, you'll have to go into what amounts to another reality or parallel universe, and there you will see all the stuff described. What what I notice is I have no claim on any of it, but people's passion about whether it's this way or that way, and some of the events in the story it really intrigues me that they're so passionate, and they're not in a position to know. They're in no position to know it. But their passion is convince them it's this way or that way. So in other words, what that tells me is people have a propensity to be irrational when you get to certain subjects. Their gray matter starts to wiggle in ways that it doesn't wiggle if they're doing a routine activity. Yes, I agree. That's why it would take someone with a grounded, serene state or nature like a an elder, of a Native American elder or an Aboriginal elder, for example, someone that has not necessarily been tainted, if you will, and I don't mean that in, in a negative sense, but uh, for someone coming out of one of these projects, they may have like shunts and blocks placed in them. Totally, totally. Precisely to prevent them from doing what we've just been talking about. And the ind- uh, indigenous person uh, who were to access this would more often than not Uh, speak of it in a language that is going to defy human understanding. Uh, Yes. Because they're often that way anyway. So it's sort of like it's by access, access is by invitation only. And I have received a, you know, I I don't know if you get these in Australia, but in America they're very prevalent. You are pre-approved for a credit line of $10,000. Well, I've gotten the pre-approved invitation uh, from Radu Cinemar and also from Dr. David Anderson, you know, to see his time travel lab or a time travel lab. 
So, in other words, this is the pre-approved. I've been pre-approved. Um, I still have to go through the, uh, the approval process. Now, the pre-approval cards are generally sent out to targeted audiences. That means that if you get one, it's a pretty good chance that you'll get approved for a credit line. It, even if it's not the $10,000 or whatever they're saying, you know, maybe it'll be less. But there's a pretty good chance you'll get it. So I've gotten the pre-approved <laughs> invitations at this point. Well, we've reached the end of the first hour. We've been listening to our very special guest, Peter Moon of DigitalMontauk.com, TimeTravelledEducationCenter.com, and the writer of a whole slew of books about the Montauk project. And we've been discussing his most recent works about the Sphinx in Romania and the Hall of Records beneath it. Uh, if you like what we do here at the Cosmic Switchboard Show and you believe in what we're doing, please go to our website, thecosmicswitchboard.com, sign up and become a member. In the next hour, uh, we'll ask Peter to talk about the Montauk Project and how his involvement developed in the Montauk Project, his interactions with some of the key players in the Montauk Project. So we'll see you at the top of the next hour. <laughs>